Uh, my introduction, my name is Bob Gardner. I'm a senior vice president uh, with SCS Engineers. I've been with SCS for some 40 plus years and I've been involved with the design and permitting and construction of landfills, material recovery facilities, transfer stations, landfill gas systems, you name it. Um, I think the one thing associated with any facility that is handling petrucible wastes is you gotta manage this thing called odor. And so that's gonna be the primary uh, focus of our discussion today. And what we hope to talk through today in the 45 minutes or so, or hour we have together, are to talk about the science of odors. Uh, for example, one issue that we're gonna talk about, uh, the challenges that our clients have with respect to odors, whether you're, again, whether you're a landfill operation, a transfer station, a material recovery facility, a compost operation, an anaerobic digester facility, all which handle waste that can decompose and create odors. We're gonna talk about those challenges, we're going to talk about some recommendations regarding to responding to odor complaints and issues that you have. We're going to talk about how you measure odor. That's always an interesting one. Uh, masking agents, do they work? Which ones work? Which ones don't? Regulatory issues associated with odors. And also dealing with when things go badly and you get into a situation where there's litigation, how do you respond to that? What are some of the tips that you need to keep in mind or things you need to keep in mind relative to responding to those. But let me first introduce our guest panel that we have to have today. I, I have two folks that I, I consider really the experts in the field relative to odor issues and air quality issues associated with solid waste facilities. Pat Sullivan, whom many of you may know, he has over 31 years of experience and expertise really is focused on air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, odor issues at solid waste facilities. He's the managing director of SCS's operations in the Southwest, which is one of our largest operations. He oversees our greenhouse gas and a risk ass assessment programs. He's one of our national act experts on odors and toxic chemical exposure from solid waste facilities. He also is a senior vice president and member of SCS's management advisory committee. Tom Rappel, also has some 40 plus years experience in, in terms of managing air quality compliance and pollutant dispersion and other air measurement uh, programs. He's uh, really considered an expert in atmospheric dispersion and transport of airborne pollutants and particularly in the areas where you have complex terrains and landfills, for example, can be a, a complex a terrain. He has the technical knowledge associated with pollutant movement and formation in the atmosphere to help assess issues associated with, for example, odor migration. He's got, one of the interesting things, he's recently completed a, a study for CalPUF, I love that acronym, uh, model to use to investigate specific odors related to landfills. So pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and I think you'll get a sense uh, during the presentation in terms of the expertise that they bring uh, to, the, to the table. So what is odor? I, I was thinking about this and I was going, well, you know it when you see it, but really it's, you know it when you smell it. And you can't drive down an interstate sometimes. Where I, I always kid with my, my kids. Uh, I, I, can, I know when I'm coming close to a landfill because I smell, I can, you know, it, during certain atmospheric conditions, you, you just know it. it's got a distinctive odor that you have to deal with. The nose, as you know, is a pretty sensitive receptor. So Tom, um, in terms of, the odors and the science behind odors. Can you help us understand a little bit about the science that's just, you know, we, we, again, we know it when we know it, but there is science behind it, right? Yeah, so definitely, Bob. Thanks for that nice introduction as well. Um, yes, there is definitely a science behind defining odors. And um, a lot of that is outlined in, in methods provided by ASTM, ASTM 679, ASTM 744 and some other ASTM uh, methods and guidance that provides uh, how to characterize odor, how to define its odor concentration, how to uh, define odor in terms of intensity, its uh, you know objectionableness and uh, or acceptableness uh, in some cases. So it's uh, you know it boils down to the fact that odor isn't caused by one specific chemical. It's generally a result of uh, an, al an amalgamation of several other chemicals that are present 
that our noses are sensitive to. The other issue is, is that uh, everybody doesn't sense odor in the same way. And uh, so populations have uh, different ways they sense odors and, and that's how we get a very varied response you know, from populations when they're introduced to various odors. So I hope that helps in terms of understanding uh, you know, the complexity of the odor science aspect. Pat, have you had any in terms of as your view in terms of the science behind odors? What are some of your thoughts? I think uh, Tom hit one important point is the the potpourri that exists, and in, in, in that's especially true for landfill and solid waste facility odors. It really is a, a combination of multiple chemicals, so it's very difficult to uh, you know pin odor down on on a single chemical. It, it makes the investigative portion of it more difficult in some cases. Um, and uh, it sometimes also makes the remedy more difficult because it is a combination of things. We see a variety of chemicals that are contribute to odor at solid waste facilities. Uh, it may be hydrogen sulfide that comes from uh, landfill gas. It could be uh, ammonia. It could be uh, terpenes, uh, volatile fatty acids, ethyl acetate. Those are some of the common chemicals that we see when we do test, but the reality is Every solid waste facility is a little bit different. Uh, and really the odor is a combination of all of those things. And that's what uh, is being detected. Occasionally we do find a facility where one chemical uh, is driving the, the pr predominance of the odor issues and complaints. Maybe a facility with extremely high hydrogen sulfide in the landfill gas and, 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 my, and gas emission issues related to that. So, but in more cases it's, it is that combination of odors. And then the other thing I'll say is um, the modern active landfill of today has a lot of things going on besides just landfilling. And, and that's also true of some of our recycling and, and composting facilities as we combine all these different solid waste facility operations together, which is actually a very efficient way maybe to, to manage a, a waste. We're also combining a lot of different odor sources and, and a lot of different potential individual chemicals that drive odors. So definitely good to think about odors in that way for solid waste as that kind of combination of multiple sources and multiple chemicals. Bob, Sorry. Bob I wanted to add something to that if I could. Sure. Too. Uh, it just came to mind. Also, odors are not always just gases. They are you know, related to parcels of uh, particles or aerosols. And therefore, the dispersion of those are not necessarily identical to, to maybe a gaseous pollutant. It may, it may be a result of more of a particulate pollutant. So just wanted to add that. Tom, you, you were talking about in terms of the objective standards of defining odor and measuring, in terms of measuring odors, uh, you know, I, again, I, I smell it as subjective. You know, to me, a bad uh, an odor, it's like some people like certain perfumes. Well, I hate perfumes or uh, you know, I, I can't, you know, other people say that it's great. So in terms of measuring odors, the, the objective measurement, can you talk a little bit about the technologies and the uh, methodologies associated with that? Sure. Um, you know, typically uh, I, I like to measure odor in terms of odor concentration. And odor concentration is defined by the number of dilutions of clean air under an equal volume that would, that would take to reduce a odor in a parcel of air to the point where you can't smell it anymore. So obviously something that has a very high odor concentration requires more dilutions of equal volume of air to basically reduce it to a point where someone doesn't smell it anymore. So when you define odor in that way, then you can treat it more as a number like a part per million, all right? It has uh, a tangible concentration value to it. Now, there are other methods of, of, of defining, you know, odor concentration or the severity of odor, and that's more of a reference method. And that's uh, outlined in ASTM 544. And what that is done, where, where What's done there is that uh, the observer of the odor, uh, you know, the technician and the odor lab basically is trained to compare that odor with some reference concentration of a, another pollutant. Typically it's uh, uh, albutanol is usually used to, to do that. And, um, and so 
that scale is generally a one to five or one to 10 scale where odor concentration is a number like you know 10 or 15 dilutions to threshold. So the higher that number, the higher the concentration. And um, so the, those are you know, aspects of how to measure or define a measured value of odor. I think I asked this question once before, but I may be putting you on the spot again here, but in terms of myths associated with odors, are there any you know, common myths that you've had to deal with in your career that you just, you have to kind of deal with uh, when, when there's an odor complaint or other issue that rises to a level where you've just got a lot of either public involvement? Well, I, 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 I think, um, you know, that kind of, you know, wh where I think, I, I don't know whether you call it a myth or not, but, but it's a, a, you know, a misleading fact is, is trying to measure or evaluate the severity of the odor problem by the number of complaints one receives. And the reason being is that the, pop, you know, the population views odors differently. And also the, 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 um, the ability or the desire to respond in terms of response, you know, comes from a, a, you know, not just the sensation of an odor, but also there might be a personal driving aspect to that, that, that biases that data. So I find that odor complaints are, are useful to understanding that there's an odor issue, but it's not the way to define the severity of the odor issue and certainly not the way to manage it. Pat, I think you and I have had this conversation before relative to how we view various solid waste facilities. You know, landfills usually are bad or compost facilities are good and, 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 and we're generally neutral on that, but I, I think you've had some experience relative to a, a wide range of, of facilities, composting, which is good, but uh, there are myths associated with that in air emissions? Um, most definitely. I mean, uh, it, it, when we see the complaints that Tom refers to, uh, uh, almost inevitably, they'll, they'll, they'll be identified as the landfill if there's a landfill there, um, even when there's multiple sources going on at the landfill. But um, we definitely see odors from every type of solid waste facility. And, um, you know, they're, they're clearly not unique to landfills, but we do see a different kind of community response in some cases uh, with a landfill versus some of the other types of facilities that are just seen more positively in general or more green. That said, once the odors get to a certain level of, of significance, the, the, the public does not care anymore that there's all these wonderful green things going on at the recycling facility or the compost facility. Uh, the, the complaints will happen and there's been clearly been enforcement cases as well as litigation related to odor that are not just landfills that have happened related to uh, compost facilities and, and other solid waste operations. So, um, so while there might be a little bit of a, a, a bias certainly towards landfills being the, the, the automatic cause of odors, I think there is a recognition that, that their other facilities do cause it. And, and we ultimately see them get caught up into that you know, loop of, of complaints and regulatory enforcement, and, and in some cases, subsequent litigation. So it, it definitely happens and, and we're seeing it more often. I, I, I think the phenomenon is, a, you know, the driving force is organics. We are now being asked to manage more organic waste and do more processing of it, do more managing of it, and for all good reasons. But the more more time you, more times you touch it, the more time time it takes you to touch it, the more time more amounts that you process it, you do create that risk of odor. And so we are definitely seeing more odors uh, that are not related to the land landfills only, or when we do get a, a complaint from a, an integrated facility. And then we hone down on what really is driving the odors. It, it, it is not necessarily the landfill, the active face, or landfill gas. It actually is a co-located uh, recycling area or composting area that's that's it, 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 it major cause of those, or at least major contributors. So, um, the other thing I would add to uh, you know Tom's discussion is that we. 
not only do we see a, a disconnect sometimes in the odor complaint versus the reality of, of odors and, and something that really needs to be investigated, um, we see a wide range of disconnect in, in um, the accuracy of the individual complaints. Um, some complainers are, are, are very knowledgeable, provide extremely good information, and, 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 and they become extremely useful actually in the investigation of odors. And you begin, you can certainly trust some of that information, but then you have another batch of complaints that, that either don't match up to the conditions uh, um, or simply uh, a proliferation of complaints that occur once, once it starts and once it gets onto social media, for example, sometimes you just get this huge number of complaints and it's very difficult to match those up to, to uh, actual odor incidents. So, um, so while investigating complaints is part of the job we have to do, and it clearly is a driving force, and frankly, it still remains the main tool that regulatory agencies use for, for at least initiating some sort of inspection or enforcement. Um, we found it, to, as Tom said, unreliable, as, as, a, as a, certainly as a sole you know, investigative uh, step. Uh, you do it, but you have to do other things to really confirm what's happening. We got a couple of, of, of questions that I think are good questions that are going to relate to a topic we were going to get to in a little bit, but I thought we'd go ahead and bring it up now. Uh, one of the questions was certain states, for example, Florida, have a general odor regulation, and a lot of places have this, that say you can't produce an quote-unquote objectionable odor. Yep. This leads it to the discretion of the inspector, and can you discuss how to um, battle those kind of vague regulations and regulators. And he said, to phrase, rephrase the question more specifically, when are we going to get a fancy piece of equipment that we can bring out in the field to say there are X units of odorant in the area while in the field? That would be a godsend. Does the technology <laughs> exist or are they being developed, to your knowledge? Well, I mean, let's take take that in sections. So oh, the, the predominant regulatory driver for dealing with odors is, is nuisance statutes. And they exist in every state in the country. And they exist both in solid waste regulations as well as air quality regulations. Though what we've seen is both types of agencies seem to treat it differently. The air quality regulators, they tend to be more punitive. That Their system is set up more for investigation enforcement, NOVs, fines. And so they tend to use that same regime when they're dealing with odors. The solid waste agencies, we've you know, our experiences tend to want to work with you more and aren't, aren't always um, set with turning this into a more punitive enforcement. Um, but those, those statutes are vague. You know, nuisance is a general definition. Um, you know, it's the preventing of the, you know, somebody's enjoyment of their, their, their property, uh, you know, to a significant portion of the population. And there's a bunch of vague words in all of those definitions. And Unfortunately, you know, it puts facilities in a difficult spot in terms of how do I know when I'm causing a nuisance, you know, and how many complaints equal a nuisance. And, uh, and then of course you have the enforcement side of them interpreting it. And we see a wide range of, of you know, strategies implemented by different states or even local jurisdictions and how they take that nuisance regulation and then turn it into their how they inspect and enforce. Some are very quantitative um, or at least semi-quantitative, have a defined program, steps they have to go through. Um, they maybe have you know, various uh, grading charts of how they deal with odor. And then all these steps have to be met before they determine that it's a nuisance and therefore subject to a, a potential violation. Others, not so much, and, and it's difficult. And that's one of the things we recommend is we're trying to work with your agency and get the understanding of how they, exactly they do that. And maybe even give them, if, if that's possible, a little bit of a push to, to reach agreement on some sort of at least defined program. So while it's difficult to define a numeric value for odor um, that everybody agrees to and can then easily be tested for, for example, at least a defined program of how they investigate the odor, how they determine the source of the odor, and how they determine when, you know, it, it rises to the level of nuisance. So, um, I mean, Tom, I'll let you answer the second part, maybe, of that of the the science and 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 
are we getting to a point where we have numbers that we can use in that regard? Yeah, no, thanks, Pat. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, you know, irrespective of how indiv individual, um, you know, uh, regulatory agencies enforce odor compliance, uh, in order, I, you know, I, I'm very much a proponent of understanding odor concentration and, and, and quantitizing odor uh, in its own sense to manage it from a, from a perspective of someone who has a landfill or other source of an odor. And uh, while it makes sense that eventually what you want to do is reduce the number of complaints, and that's the ultimate goal, uh, because the regulatory agencies are, are more prompted by that. Uh, in order to I understand where on your facility is uh, causing the odors or where in your area is causing the uh, odors, maybe an offsite source, uh, quantifying the odors in such a way, uh, such as a, a dilution the threshold concentration or odor intensity value, uh, is the best way to understand where to begin mitigating odors and addressing them in your operation. So I hope that helps. And, and just to add to the, the dilution to threshold or the D over T, there are a few states in the, in, in the U.S. Right. that use that and have written that into either their regulations or at least into their guidance that they use internally investigating odors. So they We've seen values as low as, as 5D over T used as a threshold to maybe more common, I think, is maybe 7 or 10 used as a threshold when they then define that you, they believe that odor is now risen to the, the point of a, a potential yes. problem or, or even a violation. And, but even with those numeric kind of thresholds, it's still difficult you know, to how, how do you measure that, who measures that, what methodology does it need to be a formal sampling effort going to an you know odor lab with with an odor panel or can you use for example a field instrument like the nasal ranger which tries to right. you know, mimic the activity that's done in terms of uh, you know estimating dilution to threshold um, so even with those agencies that have tried to get more numeric and quantitative, it, it's still, there still is some gray area there certainly. And, and it certainly makes this one of the more difficult compliance issues for a facility because we just don't have that absolute. We went out, we did the stack test, we either we passed or we didn't. Um, right. Are we getting better? Uh, I, I guess, you know, there's a few more agencies that I think are more knowledgeable these days and don't immediately try to turn every complaint into a violation, but still a lot of inconsistency out there. I don't think there's agreed upon methods. And um, so I think part of your, what you can do as a facility is try to work again with that agency, understand how they do it, and maybe even try to educate them and, and reach some agreement on, on, on how to approach odors um, for your facility. I'm not suggesting that's easy to do, but um, you definitely need to understand at a minimum how that particular agency that's regulating you, how they deal with odor. How does their inspector follow up on a complaint? How does he or she decide whether that deserves some form of enforcement or or it will be considered a nuisance so that you at least know what you're working against, even if it's qual qualitative in, in nature. So let's talk about some specifics relative to dealing with the issue. You know, the, the, the technology, you, you have a complaint or you have an odor, let's say hydrogen sulfide. One of the questions that came up was dealing with what's the best way of reducing odor nuisance related to hydrogen sulfide? What technologies, what approaches, and you can and we can talk about facility to facility, whether it's a, a landfill. Uh, we can talk about that. We can talk maybe a compost facility. Those would be the two ones I think that would be the, the strong, or anaerobic digester would be the strongest ones relative to uh, hydrogen sulfide. But when you have a hydrogen sulfide issue, what, what, what do you commonly recommend the steps a client should take? Um, uh, I, I can address that initially. Um, you know, hydrogen sulfide is a major is a major driver, or sulfur bearing um, you know compounds are a major driver on a lot of landfill gas issues surrounding landfills. 
uh, it's not so much a driver on the, um, uh, the working face emissions and the trashy smell that comes, sometimes comes from working faces, but when it comes to landfill gas emissions, hydrogen sulfide or sulfur bearing compounds generally are the, the, the driver to odors uh, that are experienced by the public. And um, typically uh, a good and easy field instrument to use in determining you know, ambient odor concentration is like a Jerome analyzer, you know, that I think it's the 551, one of the 500 series, you know, instruments. And it's very easy to use. It has a, a low threshold. It can measure down to about three parts per billion. Uh, in the lab, uh, hydrogen sulfide is detected at a half a part per billion. In the ambient outside air, you know, two to three PBB is generally where public where the public generally begins to recognize uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide. So a, a Jerome instrument is, is a real instrument to use if hydrogen sulfide is your issue. There are obviously other you know, um, instrumentation that can be used, uh, particularly if it, it's in a fixed uh, monitoring location you know, that's running 24 seven. So there's a number of analyzers that are available that can that can actually get lower than the three PBB level, um, uh, but those aren't portable. The the Jerome instrument is portable. Yeah, I mean, one I know uh, some some of the work I've done uh, relative to landfill gas. You know, using uh, a sulfur treat or a, where you're treating the gas before it gets flared or whatever. Because even you know, you even burn uh, gases with hydrogen sulfide. You think you're destroying the compound, but you're actually creating some additional compounds that could also have have their own odor issues. Um, but uh, Pat, uh, any other ideas with regards to, you, you typically if you have a bad, ga you know, landfill gas issue, you got to collect it, you got to treat it if it's that bad. Uh, any, any comments on that? Well, sure. I mean, I'd start with, you know, guitars start with source control. What is the source of the sulfur that is being broken down by the bacteria and turned into, you know, a reduced sulfur compound like hydrogen sulfide? So, um, does a facility take a large amount of sulfur containing waste? Are they accepting, for example, the C and D fine material, which tends to have a, a high concentration of the of basically powdered gypsum wallboard, which is calcium sulfate. And it's now in a powdered form, which we believe is much easier to break down, um, you know, anaerobically in the landfill. So that's one of the key sources. Uh, sludges, particularly wastewater sludges, can have high sulfur content or just a large quantity of, uh, of, of C and D waste, which will contain those that gypsum material. So can you do it with sulfur, su source control first? Uh, can you reduce the amount of the intake? Um, I know that's difficult in the solid waste world, right? You got to take what, what's come, coming to you as the, as, the, as the landfill for that region. But we definitely have seen uh, uh, with the, the increase in C and D recycling and then the, the need to manage that fine material, which doesn't have much value, the, the inevitable place it comes back is the landfill. And we've seen increasing sulfur everywhere that's happened. And so that's one area, if you can avoid that um, in some way, shape or form um, and, and you deal with the source control, that's an option. Now for some sites, that's simply not possible. So what else can we do? Yeah, now it's good, good gas control and maybe even going beyond the, the, the control that you might need just to simply meet a you know, stop migration or to control surface emissions. Because if you have really high hydrogen sulfide in your gas, any surface emissions has the potential to create odors. You may need a more aggressive gas system, um, you may need more aggressive cover operations to help your gas system perform better. And then once you do collect it, as you pointed out, Bob, every combustion device, you know, it does not destroy uh, sulfur and the gas in the same way. So you will get undestroyed H2S emitted at the, at the stack of, of flares. Flares, particularly in closed flares, do a pretty good job and they're in the high, 98, 99%, but it's not 100. Some of the other devices that we commonly use at landfills, such as engines or turbines or, or open flares, they don't do, do as good a job of burning. So you will have excess H2S 
uh, emitted out the stack. And sometimes we've seen sites where that really was the driving force, whether it was because of the location of the, that control device on the facility and, 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 or the fact that it's now dispersing H2S at a higher elevation. So we were, we were affecting locations that were uh, a, a different place than maybe where the surface emissions. So have you dealt with uh, dealing like pass events um, where, where they're flaring the gas out and you've got hydrogen sulfide? What did, have you done anything to help control there? In terms of, so you're talking about like sites that maybe do passive venting for migration control or something, yeah. right? Now you're just venting, you know, whatever gas is getting into that perimeter vent trench or whatever yep. device you're using for venting. And, and it may not be, you know, 100% pure landfill gas, but it's clearly got gas and it's going to go out untreated. So uh, what we've done in some cases is uh, where we locate, at least where we daylight those vents and making sure you're not putting them right on the property boundary with the neighbor on the other side. Um, obviously, we've used the solar vent flares that at least give you some degree of combustion of that vented gas uh, so that you're destroying some of the H2S. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the final step, of course, is end of pipe treatment. Um, obviously, that's always the lowest on the totem pole of things you want to do, but landfills do use, uh, you know, other types of, of you know, facility-wide odor control, whether that's using odor neutralizers um, or other mechanisms, barriers, um, you know, foliage, growing of trees, other things all have some benefit. You know, I don't know that there's any one strategy by itself that, that some, you know, can will, will always work and will always control those emissions. And, but there are some things that, that can be done in that regard. But if you're controlling your, your main source of control of odors is your, your, you know, perimeter misting system, um, that's a, uh, you know, that it's tough to, to, to stop all odors just with that type of system. So I think you really do need to look at source control and, and, and other types of uh, management options so that if you still need a perimeter type system or some sort of system like that, it's only managing residual odors after you've already implemented additional engineering controls within the, within the facility. Uh, and, and all of what I just said goes for composting too. You, it's simply, you know, some different pollutants. It's not a hydrogen sulfide necessarily. It might be volatile fatty acids. It might be terpenes. It might be ammonia that are driving odors from composting, but same rules apply. Source control first before you try any sort of, uh, you know, perimeter or, or end, sort of end of pipe concept of treatment. Um, uh, you have an odor complaint or you have an odor situation on a landfill, and what what is the process you go through to figure it out? And I think we have a graph. You have some graphics to kind of show the complexity of a landfill and the complexity of meteorological issues. How do you go about uh, one figuring it out? Um, how do you go about modeling it? How do you go about in the field actually kind of figuring out where the odors are coming from, where they're going, how they're flowing? Well, um, Bob, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. We could probably spend the next 20 hours on that, that, that subject. So <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's quite a bit there. But uh, what, what I've done is I've taken the AP42, a, EPA AP42 profile of, of chemicals that are generally in landfill gas and then converted them by using their odor index by each one of those, one of those um, each one of those chemicals, and then coming up with an odor concentration related to the concentration of those chemicals. Obviously, what you get is a whole different profile of what causes odor from landfill gas. And um, I don't know if that slide is up, but the top five in landfill gas, based on the AP42 profile, is H2S, methyl mercaptan, ethyl mercaptan, carbonyl sulfide, and dimethyl sulfide. Oh, here, there it is. But when you look at the gases coming out of the working face, uh, it's a lot different. The odors that uh, are 
predominant out of working face gases or related gases are generally ethyl acetate, liamine, ethyl or ethanol, uh, methyl mercaptan, and xylenes. So they take on a different character. And, and, and remember, this is not the concentration of the gas itself. It's the odor concentration of the gas itself. Now, if you go to the next slide, uh, Diane, just go to the next slide. I don't know how that'll come up. When you walk around a landfill, I hope you can, everyone can see everything on this slide. Maybe you got to run it. Yeah, there you go. Um, you know, this is just a concept of what someone smells when they walk around, let's say, different components of a landfill. You know, the recycling areas. Uh, you know, these are just conceptual, you know, sections of maybe a landfill. And, um, and if you, you know, if you plotted this out, this is not necessarily fact, it's just a concept. But what happens here is that this, this is how you would smell it if you walked around the landfill. But, but that's not really the profile of emissions because emissions is linked to how fast those gases are leaving you know, each one of these sources. So if you go to the next, next slide, when you combine the flow related to those areas, the whole profile looks different. And this is, the pro, this is where you want to be. This is what you want to, how you want to define your landfill in terms of its odor emissions profile. And then from here, you can understand where are the low hanging fruit that you need to address that may be causing your odor issues. You know, in this particular concept, and again, so the concept, it was the working face. If we go to the next slide, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, what shows here is that the working face, uh, you know, volume flow of, 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 of gases is much larger than areas that have intermediate cover or final cap. And so what happens is when you merge those two um, uh, you know, data sets, uh, you find out that sometimes your working emissions may be your, 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 your dominant odor source and it may not be H2S. Uh, although there may be H2S emissions that are so slight, but since the concentration, odor concentration of the gas is so high, it may have uh, you know, uh, an influence on, on offsite odors. So you need to understand this in order how to approach, uh, you know, uh, reducing and mitigating your odors from your landfill. And Pat, you might want to uh, expand on that. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a a, a good point. The, um, the 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 difficulty there is is getting the flux part of it, getting that rate, and it's not always as easy as as you'd like it to be. These are area sources. You can't easily just run them through a stack and get a stack test number, which makes that part more difficult. We do have data from other studies to get it, give us a kind of a sense. And there are methods to do it. Um, but uh, I, that's the one point I will make is uh, concentration is relatively easy. Um, but the, the flux part of that, the rate part of that is a difficult or difficult thing to measure. Um, but some, as Tom's pointed out, it's sometimes it's critical because concentration alone doesn't always tell you the whole story um, in terms of what really is contributing the most to a rate of uh, odor concentration being emitted to the atmosphere. Um, and, and then the, obviously the next part of this is, okay, where does it go and how does it get there? Yep. And that's even more complex. Um, <laughs> And the landfills in particular, but, but even other large uh, facilities make this more difficult than, 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 uh, than other facilities because of the, the nature of the terrain at these facilities. And landfills have their own terrain, they create their own terrain, and their terrain's constantly changing as they fill. And we have landfills that are built into canyons, filling up existing holes. We have landfills that ultimately are getting bigger and bigger mounds. And they do create their own meteorology. And so they're very difficult sources to just, you can't simply look at the regional meteorological data and say, oh, okay, the winds are blowing this way. Therefore, it's only winds go from this direction. Because uh -uh. when you get onto the landfill and see what happening there, we see a lot of different wind patterns and you need to know those patterns to, to understand both 
how odors are getting off site and potentially impacting the neighborhoods, but then how to control them because sometimes your control will depend on knowing the exit points uh, where, where those odors are likely leaving the landfill. And that's not always obvious and it does take some additional analysis. So while you're dealing with the chemical analysis, also deal with that the meteorological analysis because together um, they, they go and they, they tell the whole story where one part of that may not give you the whole story. Um, you might want to comment on, uh, I thought it'd be good to pull up this slide and to kind of make that, uh, hammer in that point with regards to odor emission sources and how you go about dealing with the, with the terrain and flow. Um, well, it, you know, this, this was uh, from a presentation we've done uh, many times, but it illustrates how, you know, you initially approach the odor problem from a landfill is to divide your, your, um, your operation up into various components in which you can define not only your odor concentration, but also the volume flow related to that odor concentration you measure relative to each one of these sources. Like for example, the red would be, um, you know, uh, you know, covered areas, uh, you know, the green is the working face, uh, you know, the uh, leachate ponds or the yellow, um, you know, the, the teal is, uh, is uh, you know, final cover, you know, and recycling areas were purple here. So, you know, again, a concept, but uh, the more you break up your facility and the more you begin to understand each one of these subcomponent sources and how they contribute to odors that are emitted into the atmosphere, the better uh, you, know, you can then manage your odor issue. Uh, some people just believe that their odor issue is H2S and we're just going to you know, uh, fight the issue on an H2S level. It may not be. And, um, and, and it's, it's best to take the time to basically understand, you know, the components that evolve around what your overall odor emissions profile is. So on hydrogen sulfide, it, it, you know, it, there isn't an enforceable standard, right? I mean, it's, it's generally not a, from a, you know, OSHA issue, I guess you get, you have standards. Oh, yeah. but, 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 and the concentrations we're dealing with there's no enforceable standard on H2S. Well, there, 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 there are. In some states, okay. there are enforceable standards. Um, you, know, uh, you know, California, I think, has a standard of uh, 25 ppb. Uh, you know, um, Louisiana, I, I know, has a standard um, which is higher related to more of a, a safety issue than an air quality issue. So there are, there are standards out there, but... Um, uh, but in general, yeah, if H2S is your culprit, it generally the odor is more present at lower concentrations before you reach that standard. Yeah, for sure. You've got you know, your OSHA type safety driven standards that are, you know, workday standards or, uh, you know, IDLH immediately dangerous to life and health kind of standards, but those could be even be in the parts per million range with yeah. With, with hydrogen sulfide, but then you've got the health risk based numbers and you know hydrogen sulfide is considered to be a, an acute toxin and, and as well as a chronic toxin. So that may, through risk analysis may result in even lower kind of thresholds that you can have for hydrogen sulfide. But the odor threshold, well, the odor detection level is tends to be lower than that. And while I, I'm not sure there's an there's published odor thresholds out there from different organizations, but they don't have the force of law. But even those aren't always consistent with each other. And the reality is for every one that says, no, you, the odor threshold for H2S is, you know, 25 parts per billion, there's people that smell it at five and three and find it offensive. So it's a, still a difficult thing to do. So from an odor sense, probably not really an, an enforceable threshold but there are other thresholds out there um, for other reasons. Yep. Um, no. Go ahead. Go ahead Tom. Uh, well, getting back to the terrain issue too, um, Pat and I have worked on several projects recently that terrain is a driving force in terms of how 
uh, odors are carried into neighboring, you know, uh, uh, communities. And um, so, you know, one needs to be co you know, cognizant of how you will affect the local, you know, micro meteorological flow that occurs, you know, in and around your, your facility. You know, some, some landfills are located in flat plain areas. And then as the mound builds, you create your own little micro meteorology around that, that, that large mound. Uh, some are built in canyon, you know, canyons. And as you fill that canyon uh, later on, that micro flow that's uh, generated by the canyon is uh, then uh, influenced by being filled. And uh, it changes the whole dynamic of, of, of how uh, air enters uh, communities and how people are affected. And it's not only just flow, it's um, the thermal aspect of things, how one, where canyons are, are infused with air from, let's say a neighboring uh, source of odor. And then during nighttime hours, those canyons begin to stabilize and decouple from the regional flow. And then people begin to, to, to smell those odors when the odor emissions occurred earlier in the day. So, you know, it, com it gets very, very complicated in terms of assessing what, you know, you know how, how the, 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 the local atmospheric motion can actually, um, you know, impact, uh, uh, you know, your odor event. I know there was a series of slides we had, I think slides uh, 39 through 42. Yeah, why don't you bring those up? What we sure. can Show that as an example, and while she's while Diane's doing that, um, the examples that, that Tom referenced that he and I worked on recently, uh, just these were canyon fill landfills, and in both cases of recent projects, um, they had not had significant odor issues, and they'd been filling their landfills for decades, but they moved into a different area that they hadn't filled before, and all at once we had they had major complaints. And ended up in, 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 in you know regulatory enforcement type situations because of that, and that's simply because of the micrometeorology that existed in this new fill area that was different maybe from some of the surrounding conditions. And both of these landfills had an, had existing meteorological stations, but because of where those were located, they really didn't tell them accurate information of what was going on in these unique uh, canyon areas, and so they really did not expect that these odors would move the way they did and to, the, to where they did. And um, so that's a perfect example where meteorology, even though they thought they had meteorological data, kind of failed them uh, because uh, of the micro conditions that do exist in landfills and that landfills can create themselves as, as they fill. So. Yeah, Tom, I think I, I, I remember when I worked on a project with you once, it, it, it really struck me that odors flow like a river sometimes, don't they? Oh, yeah, particularly when this mound becomes uh, large or the, the canyon is, uh, is well-defined. And when you get that, uh, you know, those you know, cool, clear nights, when you get good radiative cooling from the ground surface, what happens is that adjacent air to the ground surface gets cooled rapidly, becomes more dense, and it just flows down, uh, you know, uh, it's called drainage flow, and it's, uh, it just flows down, you know, uh, down the terrain like water would flow, and, it, and it's very stable. And so what happens is it, it, it traps any kind of pollutant, any kind of gas, or even particle in that, and carries it, you know, to where people, you know, can smell it. And so, you know, addressing those uh, drainage issues, those thermal, um, you know, interactions between the atmosphere and how, how that dynamic occurs uh, can all be addressed, uh, you know, or should all be addressed when, 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 when developing a landfill. You know, vegetative covering helps in these situations, changing the, um, the reflectivity or a bit, uh, albedo as it's, as it's called for the, um, uh, you know, for the, uh, you know, surface uh, layers of these, uh, you know, closed areas might help. Uh, tree stands, 
uh, things of that sort that may, uh, you know, in, introduce um, turbulence to, you know, any kind of flow that exits the landfill also can help as well. Do you, you recommend daily cover uh, in terms of uh, looking at how their daily cover practices are? Oh, de definitely in these situations, you know, a very aggressive, uh, you know, daily cover of the um, uh, working face uh, areas, uh, keeping it to a minimal uh, you know, size, you know, I've, I've recommended sizes as small as maybe 40 meters by 40 meters and, uh, but covering, you know, that with, uh, you know, soil almost immediately. And, uh, that, that's, that's helped a couple of, uh, landfills that I dealt with in Pennsylvania. That's what they did to, to basically reduce their, their odor impacts. Yeah. So, I mean, using tarps, using whatever you can do to get it yep. covered and reduce the emissions that are coming up, I guess would be an effective way of doing that. Right. Yeah, in combination with some of those tarps, even over the the uh, you know the you know, intermediate or daily cover is has been very effective in some uh, landfills that I've seen for sure. Yeah, whether it's a permanent type tarp that's taken on and off, or whether it's a, you know, some yep. of the, you know disposable synthetic covers, plastic covers that go on, and then basically are ground back up the next day when operations start. They definitely have shown helpful. There have been several studies done at some landfills, sure. usually under regulatory action where they tested a variety of different daily cover combinations to see what would work best for their uh, their ability to control odors and, and minimize odors. The other thing I'll, I'll note about uh, that active phase is, uh, uh, is the procedure for, uh, you know, especially odorous loads. So you really do have to have a plan to have right. loads, you, number one, you need to know when they're coming, and have you know pre-planning for that, and then those are the ones that have to be, uh, you know, disposed as quickly as you can, get them onto the ground, and get them covered as quickly as you can. I've seen facilities have actually, uh, you know, excavated holes into their active face area and prepare in preparation for a really odorous load from a wastewater treatment plant or something. Early, early in my career, I worked at I worked on a project in, in the eastern shore of Maryland, and it was uh, an area where they did a lot of crabbing. And there's a stuff called crab chum. And crab chum is the result of getting the crab meat out, and it's all the residual that comes out. And whenever they would bring that material to the landfill, everything stopped. <laughs> it had to be covered like the minute it was put down, you had to get it covered. Otherwise, you were in trouble. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got about five minutes uh, before we're going to have the official end. We'll, we'll keep on. There are a couple of questions that people have posted. I would like to, after the hour, we can kind of just walk through those questions. But before we end our official session, kind of in quick, rapid fashion, uh, some practical stuff relative to things that you can do to really uh, control and mitigate issues. We've talked about some of them already, obviously. Uh, on, on, let's take landfills or compost facilities. What, what are things that you can really do um, to be meaningful changes? Well, I, I, I'll start. I'll start with that. I think um, what I advise every landfill that I talk to that they should have now, even before you have an odor problem, have a good meteorological recording met station on site. That way, when or if odor is, situations exist. You can have you can you can you have a good reference to what the winds were doing and are they related to you or where in your facility are they related to? So having that good data to reference, I think, is very important and outweighs the risks of having that data that might, you know, uh, impugn you later, maybe or not. It always is. It's good to have the 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 data so you can evaluate the trouble the the problem on a scientific level. You know, um, you know, I think the other issue is, is that um, you need to be honest with yourself about your odor issues, if there are odor issues and evaluate them and, and get to know where they're coming from. And I think you need to engage your public. If your public is, you know, um, uh, complaining, uh, engage them as part of the solution to this problem. And, uh, you know, good communication, I think is really important, good Public relations is important. Good, being able to uh, establish a bridge of communication between the public and, and your facility, I think, is very, very important as opposed to an adversary relationship. Yeah. Pat? 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I will. I, my mantra on this has always been uh, proactive versus reactive. You really don't want to get behind odor complaints. They can skyrocket and snowball pretty fast. And uh, and before once they're out of control, once there's a huge number of complaints, once they're complaining to regulatory agencies, it's almost too late. You, you've kind of lost control of it a bit. And somebody else is going to be driving subsequent steps, and it's probably going to be a regulatory agency or, in a worst case, a, a plaintiff a lawyer in, in their uh, class uh, action lawsuit. So be proactive. Um, it's not going to resolve itself on its own. Uh, you've got to take those complaints seriously. That doesn't mean you believe every complaint and accept that everything they say is accurate. You still investigate, but that's the key. Do those investigations. And as Tom said, you, you've got to engage the public. Best case scenario, you really want the public complaining to you, to the facility, develop that kind of relationship and those open channels. If they're, if they're complaining to the regulatory agencies uh, or even to the po political system in that area, you probably already partly lost the, 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 at least the first battle. So that's key. Um, but you, you've, 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 you need to fight back, but you need to fight back with information. So that means doing the investigations, that need to be done and, and so that when you're, if you're gonna go back to the public and say, we didn't do this, or we are not really the major cause here, you need to have that data to back it up or it just won't be believable. Every facility should have an odor management plan, whether it's formally required by your permit or regulation. And in that plan, there should be a, a complaint response procedure, how you will respond to those complaints, document them. And all that information becomes useful because if something does go south, and, and again, that worst case of a litigation, you want all that information to document everything you've done and the complaints and, and the things that you did to, to, uh, you know, to, to you know, get on top of the situation and remedy it. Um, in terms of what practical things at the facilities, I think we've touched on a bunch of them. You know, it's source control, try to control it at the source wherever you can. Um, better control systems, whether they're gas or otherwise. Yeah, at the compost facility, it's aeration. It's a recognition that it's very difficult to, to, to take organics, particularly if you're gonna bring, start to bring food waste into your compost and not control those emissions. And, and you know, how close are your neighbors and, and, and understand that situation as well. Um, and if you do have a situation with a compost facility, We've had multiple compost facilities that while the permit allowed them to take food waste and bring it into their existing open windrow facility, they absolutely regretted it later when they saw the, the, the odors and the complaints and the issues and then all the subsequent work of up. In the end, they still had to upgrade the facility in which they probably should have just done it ahead of time and could have avoided a lot of headache by putting in a controlled system and covered aerated static pile with a bio cover, bio filter, or maybe a synthetic uh, gore type cover, something. Do that? Does that cost more? Yes, but frankly, I think it's better to, to design that in at the front end rather than have to do it under duress, under regulatory action, um, and everything that goes along with it. So um, that source control is is key. I get that we can't you can't always do everything that we'd like to do, and and landfills sometimes don't really have a choice but to accept some of the wastes that that are you know show up at their gate. But understand the implications. So if you start to take C and D fines, H2S is going to increase in your gas. If you decide that you now got this great source of uh, of, of revenue from uh, uh, from you know wastewater sludges, well they're gonna they're gonna add liquids, they're gonna add um, sulfur content, and they themselves are fairly odorous even when they arrive, and so they can present some issues. And so understand those in the the context, and maybe. Uh, you know, maybe look at upgrading your systems to better manage those kind of wastes if you're going to to decide to accept those. So, um, I mean, that's that's the advice. Uh, and I guess the last piece I'll give is if you do get sued, hire a really good attorney that has experience in these types of lawsuits, these kind of class action. Um, you're gonna have to spend money to defend yourself, unfortunately. Um, but but you need to do that. These these cases can be won. We have been successful multiple times in defending facilities and even in cases preventing even the class from being certified. So the lawsuit really couldn't even go forward. But it took a significant amount of money and effort 
um, to do the, the work that was needed to prove that really the, the, the landfill or the compost facility was not causing the odors that, that were being attributed to them in this lawsuit. So all that said, and while you can win in a lawsuit, you can also lose. And uh, I think it, the best advice is do what you can to avoid getting to that point by you know, proactively managing your odors and your potential to cause odors so that we don't end up in that kind of situation. Because even in victory, you're going to expend a significant amount of money and you're gonna use up some of your, uh, your goodwill with your public in that process, so. Well, we're gonna keep on going. Obviously, we, had, we, we just reached about the hour mark and we've got about four or five questions that people have uh, asked. And so uh, for those of you who wanna stay on and listen to some of the, the questions and some of the answers, I would welcome you to do so. But I know some of you may have other commitments. Um, but let's uh, start with a, a couple of, of the questions. I think this is a good one. Um, is surface emission monitoring for NSPS purposes a good way to locate where odors can also be escaping or does CH4 methane not equal odor compounds? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. CH4 does not have an odor. So, uh, <laughs> that is one of its limitations, but clearly it's the predominant component of landfill gas. That's why it's in the regulations as the monitored component. So it does provide some value in terms of seeing where you may have you know, leaks of, 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 of landfill gas. And if your gas contains you know, sulfur, all gas contains H2S and other sulfur compounds, but the concentration. Um, but I would say that by itself, it may not be enough. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't tell you the, that flux term or that rate term that Tom mentioned earlier. So just because you have a 500 ppm hit doesn't necessarily even mean that that location is, has a huge flux rate of emissions associated with it. You may have another area that's at you know, 400 parts per million that's technically in compliance, but it actually could have a higher flux. Also, you need to know the concentration of, of sulfur in your gas and not just the, the, the average at the flare station, that's important. But what we have seen is a variety in, in a range of concentrations throughout the well field. And that's because you may have different wastes in different areas. You may have different ages of wastes. So we have seen, I have seen sites where uh, one well has concentrations as high as 10,000 parts per million and other wells are under a hundred. So you need to know where that sulfur is on your site because that'll help you focus your efforts. So if you're having odor issues, surface emission monitoring by itself is probably not enough. Um, you may need to bring out the Jerome meter that, that, that Tom mentioned and use that in the context of surface monitoring to see where, where you have you know, elevated H2S concentrations versus just elevated methane. And they're not always in the same place right. because of that you know, you know, flux issue that, that we talked about. Also, uh, measuring the concentrations of sulfur in the gas and, and, and not only again at the flare station, but at, at each individual location. You can do that with field techniques. You don't have to, to send lab samples. You can use Drager tubes for that purpose because it really you're just trying to get a relative concentration and distribution of the sulfur. And then you want to know what, what are basically what are the higher producing areas because you may have high sulfur in an area, but if it's you know, it's a lower producing area and may not uh, you know, be causing the problem. So it's a combination of things that you kind of, in pieces of information or, or, or layers of information, you kind of have to overlay. And the NSPS SEM is part of that. And it, it can be a useful piece, piece of that, but by itself, um, it may not be enough. And, and even when it comes to measuring methane, there's other techniques like maybe a drone-based study that may give you a more holistic picture of where you have leaks. Also, the drone can get to areas that you can't always get to in a SEM because they're, you know, they're dangerous steep slopes or otherwise uh, areas that you can't get access to. So, um, don't want to discount the value of SEM, and it's definitely useful. But you know, if you are having odor-related issues and you think gas landfill gas is a cause or at least one of the causes, there's other you know, data gathering, you probably need to do other investigation that's that's necessary to really tell that whole picture, so. 
So uh, these are these are. These are I, I'd like to, I'd like to add to that a little bit. Okay. Just just and and I agree with everything that that Pat said on that. Um, but having measured, um, you know, combinations of H2S and um, uh, methane uh, at various locations in the field, it, it isn't constant. And the H2S emissions take on a whole different, um, you know, co time constant than the, uh, than really the, uh, the, 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 the methane, the methane emissions. And, um, you know, when you pull a sample of landfill gas out of some header, you know, it's all integrated, you know, with regard to various wells and locations of your landfill. But uh, when you get on your surface, um, you know, the, the places where H2S is emitting versus where maybe methane may be emitting may not even coincide. And uh, so the, the quick answer is no, it's not a good indicator, but it is a good indicator to see, like, as Pat said, where there might be leaks and where there might be first places to look. So that's all I wanted to add on that. Okay, uh, Tom, two questions that are related to the, the meteorological issue. One was, what is included in a good weather station? And secondly, could you please explain how thermal inversion affects odor migration in a landfill? Oh, okay. Well, a ther I, I assume you meant thermal inversion in the atmosphere, okay? As opposed to maybe a thermal inversion subsurface, okay? Which I'm not a geologist and I'm not gonna even <laughs> go there. <laughs> but being a meteorologist, yeah, let's, let's start with the thermal inversion. Um, yeah, uh, when the air uh, stabilizes, you know, typically it happens at you know, night under clear skies. What happens is that uh, you get very little communication you know, uh, from one lower level to a higher level in the atmosphere. And so what happens is the roughness lengths become smaller and um, essentially the atmosphere is considered smoother. And so any emissions at a low level is confined to that low level. When you have a lifted inversion where you have, you know, the air uh, lowering in temperature as you go uh, vertically, but then you get to a level where suddenly the temperature increases with altitude, that's called a lifted inversion. And, um, and that has, uh, uh, you know, uh, ramifications on air pollution as well. Uh, a lot of our cities deal with lifted inversions that occur at, you know, three or 4,000 feet. So the emissions from cars are generally confined in that, you know, that mixing layer below that inversion and, uh, you know, allows uh, those emissions not to disperse or leave the area and then, and then air pollution built. With regard to a landfill, you could have a lifted inversion that is a minor inversion that's only a couple hundred feet above it. You know, there are meteorological scenarios that 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 that, that happens, and if that's the case, you know, uh, you know, your your emissions don't have that opportunity to disperse like uh, you would like them to. And so there's a variety of meteorological conditions that that can occur that can set up that 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 problem and. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, we don't have enough time to really get uh, involved with all those types of, of uh, you know, scenarios, so to speak. Uh, be happy to explain that if the person has more uh, questions on that, just direct them to me. Uh, so, the, and what was the first part of the-, the What's a good weather, what's, what's included in a good MET yeah. station? The, um, I think uh, a MET station that is compliant with PSD guidelines, EPA PSD guidelines, you know, a 10 meter tower, uh, a wind speed sensor that is, uh, um, you know, a has a very low threshold to sensing somewhere around a half a meter per second or less. Um, you know, uh, wind, direction, wind direction sensors that are, that are on compass degrees, not on just compass headings, I think are important. Uh, a sampling rate that is re really high, maybe once a second or less, uh, than that to defend uh, or to define uh, uh, averages on the order of about five minutes uh, would be important, particularly with regard to odors. Odor, odor impacts generally don't occur over an hour or three hours, they occur over minutes. So having uh, meteorological data on that scale would be very, very important towards evaluating those odors. So um, uh, temperature I think is important. 
Um, you know, uh, from the wind speed and wind direction measurements, you can then infer stability. So I don't think you need to do a actual stability measurement like vertical wind speed, though that helps, okay? Um, barometric pressure? What's that? Barometric pressure helps. I don't think it's that important of a driver. There's lots of papers out there that say when barometric pressure drops, you get more uh, emissions out of the landfill. That's true, but you could use a local barometric pressure reading from an airport or something like that. But, okay. um, but having a, a MET sensor that's not kind of a hobbyist you know, uh, you know, setup, it's more of a professional setup, uh, I think is, is much more desirable. Yeah, let me all ask that you that question. Once we get, you know, when we get look at that data, um, it has multiple uses. So yeah, maybe used internally and in, but, but there's cases where we need it for formal air dispersion modeling, um, whether that's a regulatory purpose, a permitting purpose, or sometimes in, in those litigations I mentioned, and it's very frustrating when that you have meteorological data at a facility and they've been collecting it for, for, for years, but it's not that quality that we're going to be able to then justify its use in any sort of modeling. So I don't think, you know, I, it, so if you can have that data and, and use it for those more informal internal purposes, but then have that quality that it reaches that prevention of significant deterioration, EPA quality, which does include some auditing and, and, and ongoing you know, you know, operations maintenance that has to be done to ensure that it continually meets that quality. I think it'll be well worth it. Yep. The other thing I'll note is, is the siting of that station is important. Yep. So, um, People like to just plop it where they have existing power, and that's nice, but that may not be the best location for your facility. Um, you may want to consider even to initially doing some, you know, you could do some temporary rental of, of stations and see, get some meteorological data at several different locations around the facility. But you definitely do want to go through a kind of a, a, a using an expert in, in how to best site it, making sure you're not putting it somewhere that's got you know, obstacles that are going to be affecting that, that, that data and making sure that it's the best location for the, for the facility. And, and I will say that on a several of our projects where we've had odor issues, we've subsequently recommended them to add additional stations because of those microclimates that, that do exist in different places on the landfill. So uh, one for sure, but, uh, uh, you know, if you do have a unique facility, um, particularly, you know, some of these uh, canyon type fills, um, you may want to consider more than one location as well. So, but um, definitely that data quality is important. We, we've run into that multiple times. And um, when you have what Tom called the hobbyist station and what was useful, you know, okay, when it doesn't give you compass, you know, actual numeric compass values, and it just says, Southwest, you know, that's not as useful. And, and when you're trying to do a, a true analysis and it's not useful at all, if you want to do formal air, air dispersion modeling, you can't yep. really use data of that quality. So um, hopefully that's helpful. Another question that had, I was asked, and, and I think we've all had to deal with this issue since we have so many people in the field, but a person asked, can you discuss any best management practices relative to drilling extraction wells and fields? that have high H2S, discuss safety for workers as well as minimizing releases to decrease the offsite odors from drilling operations. I know from uh, some sites that we've been involved with, there have been some, there have been some deaths associated with uh, uh, either working on uh, the landfill gas pipeline in a depressed area where, where the gases, whether it was methane or H2S, you know, they've had high H2S levels. One of the things that we do from a health and safety perspective and uh, best management practices relative to well drilling uh, to address the issues of odors as well as safety issues. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I was involved with one, with a project where, um, uh, you know, there was a closed portion of the landfill, but they were going to dig that closed portion up and move some of that refuse to another location uh, so that they could build a road because the, the county had an easement through that particular area and they wanted to build a road. So um, what we did was uh, we were really concerned about how the odors would be 
um, once this older refuse was, was exposed, how that odor would be experienced by the local neighborhoods when that happened. And so we, you know, didn't drill wells, but we had holes that basically, you know, allowed us to sample the air uh, in the zones where we were going to pull the refuse out. And uh, obviously looking for H2S and any kind of uh, safety issues related to subsurface gases that may exist in that area is definitely uh, something that someone should do before, you know, before opening up a landfill. And I know, Pat, we, we require all our people who are working on gas wells to have all gas monitors, to have on their body, you know, attached to them. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously we're getting into the, the health and safety world a little bit away from odors, but they're certainly related since it's in this case, when you're dealing with landfill gas stuff, same chemical that's causing most of the gas related odors is the same chemical that's our probably our biggest fear of, of you know, safety risk for workers working around landfill gas components. Uh, I think number one, yes, proper personal protective equipment. And, and for sure you have to have a, you know, what we call the four gas monitor with you for field monitoring, but also your personal monitor for H2S that, that are alarmed at different levels that, that provide that margin of safety for your, your, you know, OSHA type exposure, as well as your, again, the, the, the immediately dangerous to life and health type exposures. So that's one part. The other part is understanding what you're doing and what you're drilling into. Uh, are we just drilling a well into refuse in an area or are we gonna be working on piping? Is that piping under pressure? And as I mentioned earlier, you, you, you really wanna know what are the concentrations in that area yep. in the gas. So what's the gas in that pipeline that you're gonna cut into? What are the H2S concentrations? What do we expect? Does this area have high H2S in it? So you know when you're drilling that well that um, you're likely going to uh, create a conduit for gas to now escape through an open borehole. And um, so what are some of the controls we've done on those kind of cases? We, the, the extreme cases, uh, you, know, uh, you know, basically an odor control tenting system has been used on some sites for both gas drill welling as well as exposing of refuse. And um, those, those uh, you know, temporary movable tents with the uh, you know, venting systems inside, usually vented through some sort of carbon unit that actually do fully, con, you, know, con, you, know, you know, so this is a, it slows down your operation a little bit. It's a little more, you know, time consuming to drill, but we've been required to do that in some jurisdictions. And in some cases we felt it was critical because we knew we were drilling into area with extremely high H2S in the gas. Um, we have actually had cases where um, because of H2S leaks from equipment, we've had to, had to send people into, you know, level B and even level A, you know, uh, controls in terms of personal protective equipment. So now we're talking about moon suits or at least self-contained breathing apparatus. So you can get H2S levels. Obviously, Bobby mentioned the deaths that have occurred from it in those very sad cases, but even in some more routine cases, we've detected it. Personal monitors have gone off. Individuals realized that there was a potential issue and then we actually had to go back in to those areas to fix the problem and do that in you know, fully uh, uh, contained you know, PPE. And so it does happen from time to time. Uh, any company that's work, working in landfill gas should be prepared for that possibility to occur on any given site. Um, so I do know when it comes to the more safety side of this, uh, we do have some others at SES that are probably more versed on it than Tom and I. So I think if that individual that has that question and we want some further information, we could probably hook them up with the right person Perfect. from our health and safety team that deals with that side of it in, in the things that they do to protect the workers that are drilling gas wells or cutting into gas piping, et cetera. To be, to, be, to be clear on this, odor is not an indicator of health risk, okay? There are gases and actually H2S to a point where you can't smell it anymore, but it has a, a severe you know, threat to your health. And there's times where you can smell it and it, it literally has very little or no threat to your health. So odor is not an indicator of, of health risk and it should not be used as that for any chemical. 
So. All right, Tom, one more question on weather stations. Um, should the weather station be located on top of the landfill for accurate readings? And would air mod or other free dispersion models be useful? Well, uh, yeah, a couple answers. I think Pat addressed that too. Uh, it do, you know, the siding of the MET station obviously depends on the local terrain and topography. And so just putting it you know, arbitrarily in the middle of the landfill is not necessarily the right place to put it. You may want to put it, uh, let's say in a canyon situation where air um, parcels would exit, you know, most likely exit, uh, you know, from your operations. Uh, uh, multiple mo monitoring stations might be important, but it needs to be well exposed and representative of the air that uh, is is being, you know, being thrust over the air, uh, over the, the landfill and carried, you know, away downwind to other neighborhoods. And in, let's get into modeling a little bit. I know we didn't talk about this a lot. Um, modeling is a useful tool to understand the science of what is going on, but no one can use a model to generate forensic data. All right. So, and, and, I, and I feel very strongly about that. And, you know, models are not that accurate, uh, like AirMod or CalPuff, and their accuracies are well defined, okay, in you know, our commerce, commerce business daily publications and by EPA that there's considerable error to the, you know, to the, the predictions that come out of models. But, you know, I use models. We use them at SES. Lots of agencies use them because they allow us to understand what might be going on. It gives us an indication of where and how to mitigate a problem. So it, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it, they're not very good to generate forensic data. Obviously they're impossible, you can't do it. You have to measure something to basically show that you're, where your exposure is. And, but a model is a good planning tool. It's a good uh, diagnostic tool to understand your, your, you know, the dynamics and the physics of the problem around what you're facing. And how we've used models in, in, in our odor studies, as Tom said, they're one of the tools and by themselves, they're not gonna give you all the answers that you would need, but you can, if you have good meteorological data to plug into the model, um, you can, you know, put hypothetical releases at the different sources that you're suspecting and get a sense of where they're likely heading, how odors from that location might, you know, might move off site under different, you know, conditions. And you do need to look at the range of conditions because obviously, you know, throughout the, the a year's worth of meteorological data, every minute, every hour, winds are doing different things. So those things, those contaminants are gonna move differently. So they're useful in that kind of thing, showing what might be going on. Um, it may help you focus your investigation in a little bit and what you need to do subsequently. Um, we have done some, uh, you know, more extensive models. I think a project that Tom can talk more about is you know, where we did calibrate, you know, a CalPuff model using tracer studies to hopefully make it more accurate now of predicting, uh, you know, what offsite concentrations may result from an individual odor event. You know, that's a pretty extensive and expensive study though, to kind of get to that point where that model now is maybe a little more accurate at, at the predictions um, because it has been calibrated, but still, I st it still has that limitation that Tom's described, even a calibrated model is gonna have a, an, an error range. And uh, maybe we've narrowed that range because we've calibrated it. But, um, you know, a tool, useful, helps kind of give you an idea of probably what's going on in, in this area with the landfill, with the individual sources, how, how contaminants may be moving. But by itself, it probably doesn't give you all the answers you need. Tom, one question. Another question was uh, your opinion on phantom odor or odor memory. Sometimes he said, the person says, I think I still smell an odor hours or but miles after my first experience in it. Yes, I, I understand that happens. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty about, about an individual and how they sense an odor and how they, um, uh, we might call it, uh, you know, you know, source an odor, so to speak. Okay. And in fact, um, I don't know, Diane, maybe you can 
do this, put in slide number 22. I think that would help. And um, basically, you know, I've done a lot of, you know, paper studies on this, but a lot of, there's a lot of blind studies have been done in this area and they have shown that the population, that populations mischaracterize an odor on an average of about 40% of the time when, time, even when they know what the source is. In other words, they're looking, you know, they, they uh, sense an odor and they uh, think it, it may be one source versus another, and it really is source number two, but they think it may be source number one. They, they come to the point where it is source number one in their mind. And, um, and there have been a number of studies that are on this slide. Uh, if you know, anybody needs these, I can get these uh, you know, to you somehow, just you know, email Diane Samuels or, or Bob and, and they'll get it to me. But, uh, but, but on an average, and we have seen this in our own studies where we have actually placed a tracer gas, an individual tracer gas at various sources in an area and I had people go out and actually you know, pull samples for that tracer gas and also characterize the odors, which each one of those sources had a specific character. And they, they decided which sort, the, the, the observer decided which source was the, uh, the odor that they were sensing. And essentially we mimic this study almost perfectly. About 60% of the time, these observers got it right and 40%, they absolutely got it wrong. And uh, so th this is one of the reasons why odor complaint data is not the best way to assess an odor, all right? Sure. Another slide that you might want to put up, um, Diane, is slide number 26. And um, yeah, so everybody can see it. This was uh, uh, an assemblage of, I mean, years of data that a landfill that, we, that was, I was working with that basically, um, you know, uh, at about 13, 20, you know, 13 or 20 sites around the landfill. I can't remember exactly. Every day they went out and measured odor, measured the wind speed, measured, you know, had a great database on terms of doing odor surveys in the area. And the area was very complex in terms of, uh, you know, other um, uh, sources of odor like chemical plants and and power plants, and, and there was also rural activities where manure was used to fertilize land. But the statistics here are really, really interesting. You know, uh, out of all the time, 20, about 24% of the time, there were odors that were observed, okay, by, by the participants in the study. And of that 23%, 16% or 17% basically lined up with the landfill. 83% of the time, they didn't line up with the landfill, but all these odors were attributed to the landfill. All right, so, you know, populations get it wrong, you know, people get it wrong. And, you know, it takes a lot of effort to weed through the, the facts here. And it, this isn't always the case, but uh, in this particular, you know, uh, study, this was the case. It was, I thought it was a pretty powerful, you know, uh, conclusion, so okay. anyway. Um, I, question. I'm going to add just that I, I've had to draw drew the job of having to call uh, individual complainants as part of an voter arrest and investigation and ask, you know, just follow up with them. What were they smelling? Getting trying to get information. Um, uh, what I can say is it's per, pretty emotional for some of them. Um, yep. um, they're very upset, you, you know, a lot, a lot of yelling and screaming. In some cases, um, they really feel like they their lives have been affected. And um, but when you finally calm some people down and start to talk the details, you do really you know you can see some of the things that Tom is talking about. Um, and even some will admit, you know, at sometimes I think I smell it all the time. And 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 whether that's the phantom odor or or what, I I don't know, but. And, and, and having even them admit that some of the complaints that they lodged, they didn't actually smell it, but they saw somebody else posted on social media. So they assumed it, it must be out there. And so it really makes it, some of it less trustworthy. What I will say though, is once you do something like that, um, you will find individuals who are extremely credible and yep. people are very useful uh, because 
that while they're not still not going to be happy with what's going on, they're willing to work with you. They are giving honest opinions and, and everything seems to correlate in terms of what they say, when they say they smell odors, what they smell. And those people can be invaluable in investigation. And, and, um, and if you engage them properly, sometimes they can be invaluable in the future in terms of as you're mitigating the problem, getting their opinion on how well things are doing and how, how it's been approved how things have been improved, but just hearing some of the things I've heard said and what they say they're smelling and how they, the decision-making process they use to determine that it was the landfill, it's clearly not scientific. They definitely have a bias. Um, they not really trained noses, so they don't know always what they're smelling. Everything smells like a landfill if it has any sort of offensiveness to it in their mind. And But when you drill down and you get some better descriptors from them and you realize it probably wasn't the landfill or there's other other potential sources. So it's a, it's a bit of a, you know, dicey process to go through, but it can be useful, but you will find exactly the trends that Tom talks about, which is a lot of false positives that probably weren't legitimate. Um, it makes it difficult to universally use uh, the complaint data, but once you get through that data and you do vet it and you kind of find the, the complaint and the individual complainants that uh, are, you know, probably maybe are, are being, are accurately describing what's going on and are pre being honest, that can be very useful. And ultimately that, so that I don't want to discount complaints as a tool. I think it need, number one, you have no choice, but to evaluate the complaints and confirm that you really aren't doing what they say you're doing. And if you are, how you're going to fix it. But you know, it, it, if you really take the time to go through the complaints, you can get, glean some use, very useful information out of them, but you can guarantee that there's going to be a, a large percent that you're just going to have to kind of cut out and say, I cannot correlate these complaints with, with what's gone on at the facility. We have two more questions, and let's see if we can answer these pretty quickly. I think we can. Uh, this one's interesting. I know we're, we're we have a, a group that's doing drone work, and we've got various sensors we're testing out and using and, and applying for monitoring things. Do you see any inadequacies or successes using drones for quote unquote sniffing sensors? Uh, would you recommend following a preset route immediately after odor complaints or other times? Interesting question. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead, Pat. I can talk about the drone study that's been done. We actually used a drone study on a recent odor investigation on a on a landfill, and it was definitely useful. Uh, it was a landfill gas odor that we were pretty sure was the driving force, and the drone study gave us. It was, you know, the, the camera was set to, to to view methane basically to detect methane optically, and um, it showed us some some hot spots, kind of that heat map that you see that was very useful. Um, and so I do think it is one of the tools and, and can, can, can add to that repertoire of looking for areas where you may have releases that at least can be detected like landfill gas via a, a laser or infrared or hyperspectral camera, whatever technology they're using that can detect the spectrum of methane, for example. Um, so I do think they are, they are one of the tools in, the, in the, one of the, the arrows in the quiver of investigation for, for odors, but I, I, I don't know that I've seen them used. I don't know what all the different options are in terms of detectors and could you use a drone based detector? Can I put a Jerome meter on a, on a drone and, uh, and measure you know, hydrogen sulfide concentrations or is there something else? I, I haven't seen that. Um, but I think drones probably have the most promise, uh, both from a cost perspective, both from lower flying, you know, altitudes versus some of the other things that you probably hear about aircraft studies or satellites where you're dealing with different, re different resolution. Um, you know, I don't know that those would be in, in just the, the expense of doing a study like that is more fit fitting for a, a research type in, environment. So I don't know that those are as useful but um, I do think drones are going to be, well, certainly we plan to use them more and more to look at generally at emissions from a landfill, of, of landfill gas in particular, 
And uh, they, we've even used the drones to detect uh, methane coming off of compost facilities, which if probably shouldn't be there if it's aerated as it's supposed to be. But if it, when, it, when we see it, we know maybe there's some operational issues that related to the aeration that's not happening as well as it should. So I think we'll continue to use drones in there and you know, will be one of our tools that we'll use to investigate our facilities. We have a pressing I question. Think, Go ahead, I, think, um, I think the drone is a, is a valuable tool. I, I agree with Pat on that. I think even stepping back from the high tech science, just the visual aspect of what a drone can show you uh, combined, let's, let's say, with a smoke study. I mean, we recently did this in a, in a, in a landfill and um, it surplanted the, instead of doing, doing a very complicated tracer study, which was very expensive, probably would have cost a couple hundred thousand dollars for, you know, 10 or $15,000. We spent a couple of weeks running, you know, a drone looking at smoke studies and, and then understanding how flow occurred through canyons and, and uh, other areas. So it, it can be very effective. And, uh, and, 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 and actually seeing the actual algorithms that play in that natural environment. So Pat, there is a question. This, this one is, might take you a, a little bit to answer. Um, uh, somebody was wondering whether you lost a bet and uh, were, were with field services and you had to wear their shirt today. <laughs> That's funny. I thought that was pretty uh, good. That's a good question. Uh, well, <laughs> actually, my office is cold. I haven't been in it in a long time. I'm in my office today and Ill Services had a really nice flannel shirt that I got to wear today. So that was the driving force besides between my shirt selection today. <laughs> Last question, uh, do bioreactor landfills compared to traditional landfills help in reducing odor emissions? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't have enough data in my Whoever. Ex experience profile to actually give a, a concise answer on that. I don't know. I know biofilters are important and- uh, bio think, bi Bioreactors. Oh, bioreactors. Oh. Bioreactor landfills. Oh. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. I, you're, yeah, you're, I don't know, yeah. You're gonna speed up gas production, of course. So if you're, not, if you're not enhancing your gas system to accommodate that sped up process, you know, could you have more surface emissions of landfill gas? Um, I, Frankly, in the end, I don't think there ended up being as many bioreactor landfills as people thought there'd be when we had the, you know, the rd and waiver was out there and available. Um, so I don't know that we have that kind of testing data to see long-term, you know, are we gonna see changes in the concentrations of the constituents of the landfill gas? Um, are we, as we speed up degradation, we get more quickly to that point of, uh, uh, of you know, settlement being complete and you know, that stabilized waste mass as they like to call it, does that at least limit the time frame you know, that you might have issues at a landfill? Yeah, I, I just, just not, I don't have this, I'm with Tom, I don't think there's enough data out there to kind of I agree. To answer that properly. Um, we did notice there were some bioreactors that were, were, were implemented and and they did do some testing under a research and uh, a cooperative research and development agreement with EPA. And we did see some excess emissions really quickly generate out of that, uh, those bioreactor cells. So it became clear that gas collection at least was definitely needed faster. Um, and we did see some off gassing of some chemicals that, you know, concentration wise seemed like they were initially higher than what, what, what they had been in the non bioreactor cell, but with how, was that sustainable? We have a, pro a project that, that's probably going to begin here in 2021 where we'll be testing a, a, a new a bioreactor landfill uh, both before and after liquids addition using a, one of the various remote sensing technologies are, that are out there. This one will be using the eddy covariance methodology. So it'll be basic, but it'll be looking at methane um, using eddy covariance, which actually is a combination of uh, using optical remote sensing via lasers with uh, micrometeorological in, 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 at different elevations above the surface of the landfill. So a tall tower shooting beams across the landfill at different elevations and measuring the different concentration and the change in concentration over time. So that will be curious to see, do we, 
how does the bioreactor cell compare to the non-bioreactor cell? How quickly do we see changes when you start to add liquids? Because this will be an extended monthly study. But unfortunately, these are major research projects, so it's it's be difficult for a site to do this, um, you know, some sort of regular course of business, or even want to want to do it on a, even on a one-time basis. Uh, for example, this facility probably wouldn't have done it except that they were under an RD&D permit with EPA and, and within that permit, EPA had a quite a bit of discretion to ask them to do extra research. It, in fact, it is a research permit. That's part of its nature. So, you know, it's going to be an expensive study, even, even uh, though we're trying to save costs by using uh, you know, research you know, students at the local university. So um, still be a couple hundred thousand dollars though. So those are very difficult to fit some of those studies into the construct of a, you know, day-to-day well, -day landfill operations. But maybe as over time, as we see more of that testing occurs, we, we, we can answer the question a little bit better, but um, I don't think the data exists today. Well, thanks, uh, Pat and Tom. Uh, good, good discussion. We went on for almost two hours. I think uh, there was a lot of good questions, and so I, hopefully we've been able to address those questions. Thanks, all uh, remaining uh, participants who are there that you hung in there, and hopefully it was helpful to you as well. I found it uh, helpful and useful. Uh, we'll continue our series on uh, various environmental and landfill solid waste related topics over the next couple of months. Uh, stay tuned. And uh, I think Diane, you've uh, addressed issues with regards to offering a professional development hour credit. If you need that type of certification, let us know, we can get that to you. Uh, she'll be preparing uh, links uh, that you will be able to view this presentation and to share the link with others, uh, uh, I guess probably within the next couple of days. Um, uh, actually, they'll be done by tonight. Okay. So. The email okay. will automatically go out to you tomorrow. So um, again, thank you everybody for hanging in there and hopefully it was helpful to you and hope you can join us again. Have a good day. Bye. Thank, thank you everyone. Bye -bye. Take care. Take care.